Yo, yo, welcome back to another episode of the Dear Fathers podcast. I'm your co-host, Jesse Alex. My brother, James Meeks, couldn't make it uh, here with us today, so I'll be holding down the fourth solo. But nonetheless, man, we're excited about a special guest for another impactful conversation. Uh, kicking things off, man, I'd like to welcome legendary actor and amazing father, Clifton Powell, to the Dear Fathers podcast. How you doing today, man? I'm good, I'm good. Excuse my glasses, guys. My allergies are acting up and my eyes are swelling. That just took me a bit of a deal, so I hope I don't fall asleep doing the podcast. <laughs> oh, no, nah, man. You, you all good, man. It, it add a little swag to you anyway, man, so nobody would even notice, but I know how that pollen gets, man. It's kind of the same way. I'm in Dallas, so it's, it's kind of the same way here, man, so we definitely appreciate you tapping, with, tapping in with us at the Dear Fathers podcast, man. And we want to just kind of jump right into it, man. You know, I, I'm pretty sure everybody watching, everybody listening knows exactly who you are, man. But let's take it back. Let's take it back to your upbringing, man. Tell the people where you're from, you know, about, about your parents, your relationship with your father. What, what that look like for you? Um, you know, I had a really kind of tough upbringing. My mother died pretty tragically when I was four. And my father was a functioning alcoholic. And my dad had a, a fourth grade education. So he wasn't the most learned man. He, he worked in the government for 35, 40 years. And he, he, you know, he did the best he could to raise me. Um, when my mom passed at four, when I was four, my sister, um, God rest her soul, of course, all my most of my family has passed on uh, on my father and my mother's side, but um, she did her best to intervene in the raising of me, you know, from four years old. So I, during the week, I was with my dad, and on the weekend, I was with my sister out, because I grew up kind of like in a, one of the roughest hoods in Washington, D.C. So, you know, on the weekend, I had to get in a cab Friday after school and head out to the suburbs and be around, you know, be with my sister so she could kind of keep me out of trouble and keep an eye on me. So that's pretty much how I was raised. And, you know, um, my dad, I, I think when we look back on the history of African-American men in this country, my dad fell victim to some of the, you know, oppression and some of the negative things that have happened to black men. You know, um, he suffered from some mental abuse and anguish, um, mental issues, I should say. And, and I think part of that comes from, you know, the stress of, you know, not being able to get the kind of jobs that you can get, you should get, not being able to take care of your family. Um, hence, here comes the drinking and the drugs. And a lot of us didn't get taught how to be good fathers and good husbands by their fathers who were coming through the depression. And so, you know, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, slavery was so far along ago, so far ago, long ago so long ago, but I heard a therapist say one time that African-Americans are suffering from 400 years of post-slavery uh, PTSD. So at the end of the day, I believe that, um, I believe that my father, you know, in some ways fell victim to a lot of that, but because by the time my dad was my age, he, he had already developed um, mental problems. Yeah. And along with drinking and some of the other things that, you know, I saw him do, um, you know, I made a decision never to put my hands on women because I saw my dad when he drank, you know, he hit women. You know, my dad, I called my dad pops one time. He punched me in the face. Um, but I love my dad because as I've gotten older, I've understood the kind of pressure that he was under, yeah. and, which led to the alcoholism and he, I know he loved me. When he wasn't drinking, he was one of the most wonderful men. He was sweet. He was loving. He was supportive in his own way. So I, I thank him for being there, even in his frailty. And I've tried to duplicate a lot of his faith that he instilled in me. My father would always say, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. And then he'd always say, where there's a will, there is a way. And I always knew my dad when, you know, growing up in the hood and some Big kids would pick on me. My dad was only five foot three. He'd be the first one out the house to, to, to grab a kid and tell him to leave me alone because, you know, growing up in the hood is rough. And I was a timid kind of kid. I was wild and funny and had a good time. But, you know, I was in 
I was, you know, living across the street from the roughest project in D.C. So those kids were a lot more aggressive than how I was raised in church and all of that. So what I tried to do, and one of the reasons why I'm on this podcast, is to talk to Black fathers because the platform that I have to let them know that no matter how you were raised, you can turn it around and be the kind of father that all Black men and women need to have in their lives. So that's, mm-hmm. that's you know, and I've had some great men in my life. Well, um, young man who took me under his wing when I was seven years old. His name was Daryl Harvey. God rest his soul. He grew up in my neighborhood and he just took me under his wing. Um, I had great teachers. I got, had great coaches. And then my nephew is the sportscaster, James Brown. And JB was one of my mentors. That's my sister's oldest son. Technically, I'm JB's uncle because his mom is my sister, but my sister and I had different dads. So we always tease about that. But I can tell you this, JB took me as a little shorty and has always been an integral part of my life, even now. Yeah, man, I, th- that's amazing, man. And I appreciate your transparency so much there. And one thing that stood out of me about your story, your background, is that even through all of that, right, you know, your mom passing away, your dad dealing with all these issues, you still took away two things from him, that mustard seed and that other saying that he taught you and carried that on in order to be a better man and a better father to your kids. So I think, you know, even through everything that you went through, you found some good in that and was able to turn it around. And that's kind of the reason, you know, that this platform, Dear Fathers, started. You know, it actually started because me and our other co-founder, we both grew up without dads. I currently don't have any children yet. He has two kids, uh, James uh, Meeks, the other co-host on the podcast, he's a father. So just kind of having those conversations of what that looked like and, you know, uh, me personally wanting to get insight from, from men like yourself and, and learning your story, man. So I appreciate your transparency that, there, man. And it was great to hear that, like I said, even through all of that, man, you still found some good in that story and was able to turn it around. So, you know, I want to get into, you know, kind of a little bit further on, you know, into your career, you know, next Friday, Friday after next, you know, Dead Presidents, Ray, the Brothers, Minister Society, we can go on, you know, yes. so long with your career and your background, man. Tell us how you got into to acting from, you know, through all that growing up in D.C. How'd you get into acting? Um, you know, I, I, I believe that um, I really always felt like I had a blessing on my life. And the night that my mother passed away, um, she wasn't in her right mind. And technically, you know, really, to be honest, my mom committed suicide. And the night that my mother walked into the night, and you know, early on when I did interviews or podcasts, I used to never talk about this, but I grew to understand that this is a part of my journey. It's gonna be a part of my book. I wanna do an evening with Clifton Powell and because I wanna be able to take my life if I can inspire anyone. Because I never, I was such a cut up in school. I never believed that I would be ever be in a place <laughs> where I would inspire anybody to do anything other than throw than spit bubbles at people and throwing gum at the back of the counselor's head or something like that. Cause I was in with the kids, man, I was always cutting up, but I re- don't remember m- my mom much. I-, I-, I only have a few images in my mind, but the night she walked into the night and they found her in the bottom of the Anacostia river in Washington, DC, but for the grace of God, in my building, my cousin Francis lived right across the hall from my mom. And though my mom was not in her right mind, she took me across the hall and left me with Francis, or it wouldn't be a Pinky or a Cuddy or Dr. King and Selma Lord Selma or uh, Ray or any of those movies because I wouldn't be here. So as I've journeyed through um, my life uh, before becoming a well known actor, I, I remember when I was in the 11th grade and I was in Lincoln Center and it was a big production we did at Summer Theater. And as I was running from the bus, and a lot of times when I tell people this, it, it sounds eerie, but it happened to me. I always knew I had a blessing on my life. Even as a young kid, I knew I was special. And <clears throat> I was running and as I was coming back to the stage, big, if you've ever been in Lincoln Center, there's big pillars there. And there was a lady, an old black lady in a chair. And my energy took me to her. 
And she sat me down and put a piece of candy and a rock in my hand. And she said, stop worrying. They sent me here to talk to you. The world is going to know your name. All you have to do is have faith and believe and everything else is going to unfold and it's going to be glorious. And I was stunned. I was frozen. And I got up and of course it was thousands of people out in the square and I ran back to the stage and I looked back and she was gone. Another example of that was, and, and I got to give you this because I, because this is a father podcast, I want people that don't know me to understand how I function and who I am. And, and so in 1989, when I got to L.A., I, I couldn't afford a car, so I bought a scooter. And, you know, L.A. is nice, it's pretty. So, you know, I'm on my little scooter. The scooter only goes like 50 miles an hour, but I'm coming down sunset, blowing my little horn, you know, flirting with the girls by the car and stuff. And then one day I'm riding and a voice said, put your helmet on. And I stopped because whenever I hear that voice and we all have it, we all have a blessing on us. It's called instinct. And, and it's a special voice every now and then that may say, don't, don't take that ride tonight. Something may happen. Sometimes we ignore it. So I stopped. I put my helmet on, on top of my hat and I kept on driving. Now, I, ironically, I was on my way to audition again for rock, right? After already playing the drug dealer, they were thinking about making another character. 10 minutes into that ride, a voice said, put your helmet on. And I stopped. I got off my bike, my little scooter, took my hat off, put my helmet on and locked it. 15 minutes later, I was flying through the air and hit a bus pole going 50 miles an hour. Had I not had my helmet on, I would have been dead. On the spot. So I've always try to listen to that inner voice and that spiritual voice um, that's inside my head. Several times when I haven't listened to it, I've ended up in bad situations. So as I was coming through, I wanted to be a football player. I never wanted to be an actor. Though I was the most cutting up little kid in school, my father never called me bad. He called me mischievous. He said, you, just, you know, one time I was a patrol boy, third grade, Somebody dared me to lay out in the middle of the street. My father only went to two PTA meetings in his life. He came back from the PTA meeting. He said, who in the hell you think you're supposed to be, you damn fool? Louis Red Fox or Richard Pryor laying in the middle of the street. And I used to do crazy stuff, man. So, and I was never afraid to get into the plays and stuff. So JD, my nephew JD was an All-American in basketball. So I decided in the, in the eighth grade to transfer to the Matha which is a big basketball school. Yeah. I kind of be like JB, but I was horrible in basketball. Mm -hmm. And I remember, here's another blessing. Miss Turner, my eighth grade teacher, who never let me go to an assembly because she knew I was going to get in there and start blowing bit bubbles, spit bubbles, balls at people, and spray, banging on the table and interrupting the speaker. Because I'm in the back with all the kids from the hood, you know, from the projects. And I'm up mixing it up. And I went to Miss Turner and I said, Miss Turner, I think I want to go to Damascus. She said, you are out of your mind, boy. I said, Miss Turner, she said, if you don't stop acting stupid and stuff, you know, I'm dancing around. Yeah, I'm going to go to Damascus. I'm good. She said, you don't, Clifton, ooh, Clifton Powell, stop. I said, Miss Turner, she said, she looked right at me, bro. She said, I said, all I need you to do is write me a recommendation. She said, Clifton Powell, what am I going to say good about you? I said, I don't know, Miss Turner, you say that. And she said, boy, I, I swear to God, son, if you don't stop jumping around like a damn nut. She said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to fill out a recommendation to go with my application so I can get into the math. And the math was a prestigious Catholic high school, a hell of a basketball team. And you had to have better grades than I had. She, said, she looked right at me. She said, you know what, Clifton Powell? I don't know what you're going to be. She said, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lie on this application and say you're the greatest student, and I hope you become somebody. And I got into the math. <laughs> so now I'm into math, right? I'm on the back of the bus giving people the finger. So I got cut from the basketball team, 
it was a good thing because I was horrible. So I'm staying in detention. Like every other week, every other day, I'm in detention with my white buddies, right? So I made a decision in my own mind or a voice said, get out of the map. So I went to that summer, I transferred to St. Anthony's and that summer I saw a play. Mm-hmm. So I went to my boy, I said, yo, what, 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 what was that? They said, that's a play. I said, a play, what you do? You, they said, you just get on, on the stage and act stupid. I say, shit, I, I act stupid all the time. I might do that. So I got to St. Anthony's in September, in September of 1972. And I went to the teacher, his name is, I never forget his name, Mr. Redden. And I said, yo, my man, I want to do the play and I don't want to do no damn singing or nothing. I just want to act. Never acted. He put me in the play. He said, yeah, well, 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 he decides on it. Well, Cliff, well, we'll see. Uh, I got a lot of the other guys who want to be in the play, but you know what? I'm going to put you in there. We'll see how you do. I'm just playing around, dude. He put me in a play. And then one of these guys in the play heard about this place called Workshop for Careers in the Arts. I went up there not to go into the play, not to go in and join the program, just to be protection for my friends. The head, one of the head teachers came out three times. And you know, I'm from the hood. I've never been around out of my element. And he was like, we need more men. And I was like, go ahead, play boy. I ain't with that little bull crap. And you know, I cursed. Like, I ain't with that little bullshit, man. Go ahead with that, man. Go ahead. Came out again. He said, excuse me, what is your name? I said, Clifton Powell. He said, see, we need somebody like you in this program. You're strong, you're virile. I said, go ahead, bro. I ain't with that little bullshit, bro. This is literally how I got to the actor, bro. He came out two more times. The last time he came out, he said, I'm going to ask you one last time. I said, yo, man, what you want me to do, player? Put me in a program. The first six months of the program, I was so good, I was scaring everybody. They wanted to put me out of the program. Here's another blessing. Actor, look him up, his name is Charles Brown, pulled me in a room, and my nickname is Sweet Pea. He said, Pete, this is what it is. Debbie Allen was my dance teacher, my dance, my ballet teacher, right? And I would never wear my leotards and tights, bro, because I never, coming out of the hood, I never seen anybody with leotards and tights on. So I was like, I'm not going to wear that little bullshit right there. That's not going to happen. Charlie took me in the room. And he said, Sweepy, look, you're scaring everybody in here, bro. I said, man, what's, what's the problem? I ain't bothering nobody in this place. He said, man, your edge. And, you know, he said, I understand. He said, but I wasn't angry. I wasn't mad. I just was out of my element. He said, this is what's going to happen. They're going to put you out of the program. He said, but I told them I'm going to take you under my wing. But you've got to put on your leotards and tights. So me and Charlie sat in the room, bro. You ever had a stare off with somebody where you just stare in their eyes and they stare in your eyes like, what's it going to be? That's how I got started in acting. I said, you know what? After 15 minutes of staring at Charlie, he said, what's it going to be, sweetie? I said, you know what, man? I, whatever. If you think that's what I should do, that's how I got started. And this is literally the first time I've gotten through that story without breaking down and crying. <laughs> my dad had a nervous breakdown in my junior year and I was gonna drop out of the program. My dad ended up in the same mental hospital as my mom. My dad lost everything because back in the day when you get evicted, they take all of your stuff. So I lost everything. I had one pair of pants that I had on, outfit I had on, and a shoe. All my college applications, everything gone. I had to go live with my sister full time. I went to the workshop people and they said, you can't drop out, but this is what we're gonna do. We're going to put you on payroll, and we're going to give you a salary. We're going to give you $1,200 right now, which back in 73, that was like a million dollars, really. And they said, we're going to pay your tuition for the next two years. That's how Clifton Powell became Cuddy and Pinky and Ray and the rest is history. No, that's and amazing. so I pay homage to my teachers who believed in me. And it's really emotional for me, man, because when I look back, I didn't have a plan at all, bro. I wanted to play football. And after football, I had no idea what the hell I was going to be. I was going to be a bus driver, bro. So that's how I got started. So the reason I'm telling this long ass story is because everybody listening out there, I don't give a damn where you from, what you've been through, what your family's been through. Don't quit. Keep believing, because when you see me on television, I'm that guy. I'm that kid. 
I didn't know, but I just never quit. I always heard my father's voice where there's a will, there's a way. And if you have faith, you can make it. So I tell everybody, and I'll stop right here. I got 580 on my SATs, bro. When I do lectures, I got 580. Back in the day, they give you 200 for your name. So technically, I got 380 on my SATs. The worst score you can get is 750. I got a full scholarship to college. How that happens, it's all part of the miracle. So I tell young people, if I can do it, you can do it. That's, that's what I do when I give lectures because I never thought I'd be the guy to give back. Yeah, man, I love it, man, the transparency. And one thing I'll say, uh, going back to something you said a few minutes ago um, about inspiring others, you never thought you'd be that guy, man. And you said, you know, about, you know, just wanting to inspire one person. I'll tell you what, man, I, I'm inspired by your story. Uh, we've talked offline before this recording and just, Hearing about your story, man, obviously we know you as, you know, all these roles from these different movies and TV shows, man, which is great. But, you know, I'm inspired by the the, the journey because that's always the, the, the crazy part, man. Like you didn't know where things were going to take you. But now, you know, look at you, man, you're a legendary actor, you know, you're a father. And even fast forward to now, man, like, you know, you kind of went through the backstory on how you got started. You've been in all these roles, man. Tell us, you know, what, what was your favorite role? And why? I know that might be hard, man, but if you can you know, break it down to us, man, which one was your favorite? I think, I, I think hands down, Ray has, has to be one of the greatest roles I've ever had, um, one of the greatest movies I've ever been on. But I would say the most honorable work for me was playing Martin Luther King in Selma, Lord Selma. Mm -hmm. Now, as we know, how renowned Dr. King as a man is, and what he stood for. So Ray and Selma Lord Selma are like, I would say neck and neck. And what I want under, everybody out there to understand, I was the last choice on almost every one of these movies. Um, and then I also was the worst actor in my program before Charles Brown and Glenda Dickinson and Mike Malone and Kenneth Doherty kind of shaped me along with uh, Debbie Allen, my dance teacher. Um, I was the worst actor. I just wasn't getting it. So, you know, those two roles, uh, people don't know, Jamie Foxx, I had a great audition for Ray, and they just said, nah, we don't think he's the guy. Jamie Foxx stood up in a meeting and said, how come we haven't hired Clifton Powell? Now, I, I, I never called my friends, but I called Jamie, and I, and I said, Jamie, they thought that I was nervous, and they didn't think he said, F that clip, pal. You killed that shit, bro. So Jamie made a call, and he stood up, he had a meeting, and he stood up in a meeting and said, if Cliff Powell's not in this movie, it's going to be a problem. And that's how I got Ray. Selma Lloyd Selma, they had another name star and they just said they didn't want to see me for that role. And I said, well, my picture came across and I'm here. Let me just do it. Now, the next thing I want people to understand is, is preparation meets opportunity. So the night that I got the call about Dr. King, I stayed up all night and watched Eyes on the Prize. So then when I came in, I sounded just like King. I had a suit on like King. I cut my mustache like King. And they, they, they finally relented and said, okay, well, do you have anything prepared? I'm like, uh, damn right I do. <laughs> and I did, no, nah, it doesn't matter what happens now. We've got some difficult days ahead. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Long, and once I hit that, they said, we don't know who, what we're going to do, but you're going to be king. And, and the rest is history. So I also remind young men and women, dead president, they had another actor in mind. I read for two roles, small roles, but I asked my manager, who's playing Cuddy? She says, no, they got a big star in mind. So I begged the Hughes brothers. I, I was poor as hell. I had a wool suit. It was 99 degrees in LA. I stopped at Aardvark, which is uh, 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 like a uh, thrift store, and got me a dog hat. So I did the one character, I went back to the bathroom, put another patch on my eye, then I had a cowboy hat, and then I said, can I read Cuddy? It's like, no, 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 got somebody in mind for Cuddy. I said, brother, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just read it. I stayed up all that night and memorized Cuddy and did it just the way you saw it in the movie. That's nice. how the guy, so those three roles, man. Are, and, and then, of course, Rock was amazing. Mm -hmm. Charles Dutton, that role really kind of shot my career out for me to even go in for dead presidents or Ray or minister society. 
No, that's that's amazing, man. I love to hear the backstories on things like that, man. Um, commend you on your journey as an actor, like you said, a, a, a legend, a legend, man. And you know, I'm inspired you, by your story for sure. But I definitely want to now get into what we came here for, man. Like, you know, who who is Clifton Powell as a father, right? We know you as the legendary actor. Who are you as a dad? Man, you know, you ask the most poignant questions. I tell you, ah. Uh, Mm. It's, it's being a father is the most incredible thing that I think I've ever done in my life. I think the work speaks for itself. I think I've been able to make it through this system of racism and depression and oppression. I've never been in trouble, never been arrested, never been on drugs. Um, and I'm still getting better at 66 eating better, living better, becoming a better person, becoming a better man, becoming a better father, becoming a better mate to my to the young lady that I date. Being a father is so rewarding, but so challenging. And I didn't understand when I was married and divorced how important the father role was. Most kids between 12 because before my acting career took off, I was a career counselor and I worked in summer youth programs, always worked with youth. youth. I'm in a, a mentoring program at NYU. Um, I've done puppeteering and uh, children's theater and all that stuff. And most kids between 12 and 25 with no fathers in their lives, they fall off the grid. Juvenile del delinquency, promiscuity, drug, alcoholism, all the above. And so, I just didn't understand how important it was until I was divorced. And I look back on the things that I didn't do right. And I've tried my best to correct those things by being there for my, my, my daughter and my sons. Um, I wish I could go back and, and have the knowledge that I, I could have gotten from my dad on how to be a good father, because it's so challenging and especially when you have male sons, you know, when you have sons, they get to an age where they want to challenge you as a father. And so it's a tightrope. And I'm still working at it, you know. Um, my young son, Clifton Jr., he's, ooh, he's, a, he's so daggone smart, man. And we, we have these mental battles sometimes. And I just have to say, yo, man, F all of that. I'm your dad. You're going to do it this way because I've been there. But you can't do that. So... You know, that's a very interesting question, man. I, I, I think I've tried my best not to be the father that doesn't set a good example. But I haven't been great at it, you know. Um, I'm trying now to be better and, and try not to make my, kid, make my kids better than me. Yeah. So as you see, as I struggle to, it's so complicated. That's why we need these platforms. Right. And that's why I'm here. You know, I'm tired. I've been working. But I wanted to be here because to all the men out there who are struggling with this, man, just stay connected. Yeah. Stay connected. Because even in my frailty, I just didn't quit. Now, some people are like, well, you seem like a great father. No, I gambled. I ran around with a bunch of women. I was out of the house 80% of the time. We haven't talked about the hard part of my journey. Yeah. And my ex-wife would get on me because... I never set enough money aside for my kids so that I can give them the kind of financial cushion that some other nationalities give their kids. Mm. I'm, I'm better with it, you know, but I should have set up some funds for them so that when they get, wanted to get a car, and they want to start their businesses. I didn't do any of that, brother. I, 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 got, I didn't get taught that, but if I had just maybe listened to my ex-wife on those areas where I was lacking but then on the flip side when you become an entertainer and you're starting to move it comes with a lot of temptation brother women the fake friends people want money everybody wants this and you and you get lost in it and i got lost in it you know yeah. so that's that's a great question i think fatherhood never stops man until you die yeah no and i appreciate once again your transparency man like like you said the, the subject matter is challenging because there's no there's no book for it, right? There's no guide yeah. to what that looks like. There's no guide for life. There's no guide to being a father. Um, but that challenging part, I, I wanna ask you this because 
just the, the 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 role of being a father is just challenging in general, right? But like you said, you're an actor, you're an entertainer, you're traveling, you're on set, you're doing all these different things. How much more challenging, you know, was that for you to balance what your life looked like? I know you say you were out, you know, out of the home 80% of the time. Did that take a toll on you mentally, you know, in terms of you know, being an actor, entertainer on the road, on set, you know, how did that, 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 that affect you mentally? Just, you know, kind of trying to balance it all. Well, I didn't do a great job at it. And seven years ago, I was homeless. I had lost 5 million in my divorce. When I came to Atlanta, I had a hundred dollars in my pocket. Mm -hmm. And what I tell people all the time when I do lectures is I roll right out of the game. You know, I had a lot of women, I was gambling a lot, you know, to the tune of three, you know, to the tune of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, I had a wild life, bro, and I hit rock bottom. And hitting rock bottom was the best thing for me, you know, because it helped me refocus and it helped me clear out all the people that were takers, because they're givers and takers in the world. And I was pointing fingers at everybody, you know, and I realized. A lady gave me this wonderful book called The 12 Steps of Forgiveness. And I read that book and I realized nobody's to blame for my downfall. You know, I, I allowed it. I saw the sign. I saw some of the unfaithfulness amongst the, my partners, but I'm loyal. And, and then, you know, I was, I was out there getting caught up in the clutches of all the temptations, drinking, Thank God. And I, I told myself early on I wasn't going to do drugs. So I didn't do drugs. I was drinking, gambling, running, and I had a lot of women. And it crashed. In between all of that, I tried to be there for my kids. And 80% of the time I was out of the house. So I wasn't there for my kids like I should have been. And But I did have to go make a living. But I could have done a better job. I could have been gone 50% of the time. And that other 30%. Now, I spent a lot of time with my kids, and I was there, but I have to take my hat off to my ex-wife, Kimberly, uh, who was there all the time. And some of the stuff that she had to deal with that she heard about that I was doing and all of that, I, I can't even speak to that. I heard Shaq the other day talking about it and said, hey, I'm not going to sit here and blame Shawnee for nothing. Yeah. The flip side of that is when you go from being a little poor kid from the hood, somebody give you a million dollars, you're going to mess it up, bro. If you don't have any fathers or any guidance. So on the flip side, I, I, I don't pat myself on the back, but I still have great relationships with both of my sons. Well, my one son, my other son who's older, is like 40 something. I don't have a great relationship with, relationship with him, but I tried. I tried. I apologize to him. He's, he's never really taken a high road when it comes to me, but I know I did my part to stay in his life. Because once your kids turn 18, man, you don't have that much jurisdiction over them. So how I juggled it mentally, bruh, <laughs> it's that blessing I had on me. One time I was on the road and I was going through a lot, man, and I looked in the mirror. And I looked right in the mirror because I almost passed out of one of the shows from drinking and partying so much and being with so much. I had, I had a big party and I don't have to tell you what happened. It turned wild and crazy. I was supposed to be at the theater at three o'clock. I didn't go to bed until quarter to three the next morning. That next afternoon, I should say. And when I got to the theater, I knew it was the end. And I looked in the mirror and I looked in the mirror and I was dehydrated. And I said, God, if you take me, get me through this show and get me out of this, I'll get out of this lifestyle. And that was in the mid nineties. And I was doing a show in D.C. at the Warner Theater. And I said to myself, and I heard that voice again. I said, if you, if you get me through this show, because I knew if I passed out of the show, I'm going to be the laughing stock of D.C. And that's my hometown. And I looked in the mirror and I made a decision. And I haven't gone back on it, but I got caught up again a little bit when I got down here to Atlanta after being homeless and coming down and getting back on my feet now. I almost got caught up again and I just made a decision, not this time. So it's, it's a challenge. So I think we have to be very, very careful with entertainers, all the stuff that Will and Jada are going through, Kanye, all of that, man. It's, and it's not color. It's just people. 
It's a challenge in a pandemic. It's a challenge mentally and spiritually to stay on point all the time. And that's just a snippet because you're asking so many wonderful questions, brother, that I have to give you the whole com- complexity of the question w- without, you know, because this is just a snippet. Yeah. But I made a decision when I looked in that mirror and then I restructured my life with my kids. I tried to rebuild my relationship with my older son. My little daughter is my stepdaughter, but I've had her since she was six months. So I had to make sure I was there for her. It's all a blessing. It's all a blessing. Yeah, man. No, I, I definitely appreciate your transparency there. And then even one of the reasons that, you know, we have this podcast is to make celebrity dads like yourself more human, right? Like a lot of times when you're getting interviewed or talk to us about your career, what you do with athletes is how many points they score, all these different things, man. But you guys are human just like everybody else. So there's ups and downs and challenges. And even like you said to the Will and Jada or the Kanye stuff, what's crazy is because I say this all the time is people, you know, make fun of these people for things that they're going through until something yeah. really bad happens, right? Like if somebody was to, you know, not be here anymore, it's like, oh, we should have got them help. But at the same time, where's the, where's that kind of talk when these things are happening, man? So I appreciate you opening up about, about your story because even to the beginning, your upbringing, what that shows is a true testament to to keep going, to not give up, which is, you know, kind of even going back to, you know, what your father taught you, man. So salute to you, man, for, you know, falling down, but getting back up at the same time, multiple times, because that's what really life is all about, man. So I just want to say that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm inspired by this conversation and uh, I just want to salute you and give you your flowers you know, while yeah. we're while we're on this call, man, I appreciate your transparency. So, you know, even kind of I want to I want to before we go, I want to add something um, that I think is important. I'm dating a young lady. Her name is Marquita, and I'm not going to say her last name, but she's just taught me at 66 how to love, mm. how to be gentle, how to because I'm from the hood, so I got an edge about them. For the people that know me, my friends, they know. I don't take a lot of shit from people, bro, no more. You know, after, especially after hitting rock bottom. But I met her eight years ago, man, and she has been such an inspiration in teaching me how to love, man, because I've made a lot of mistakes with her. Not understand, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I didn't have a father to teach me how to be a father. I didn't have a father to teach me how to love, how to be a good husband. And a lot of times I've taken a lot of flack. This is one of the first people I've ever met who sat me down and held the, the reins on and set boundaries for me. And, it, and it, at the same time, helped me understand my negative and, 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 and dysfunctional behavior and not giving up on me. Because what happens with entertainers too, and not all entertainers and not all people are like this. Most people don't really give a damn about you unless you can help. And that's, mostly financial. So I, I, I just take my hat off to her because I'm not going to sit here and help this platform without really, really being honest, man. I struggle, especially when I met her. I'm better now at, 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 at the eight-year mark. But seven years ago, I was homeless and I was dysfunctional and didn't know it was because my dad wasn't there. And as I began to try to love her, I realized five years in, I don't know how to love. Most of us as African-American men, I can't speak for other nationalities, but a large percentage of African-American households are run by women. So we don't make the best fathers. We We can be, but we need help. We need platforms like this. We need forums. We need all of that. And I just take my, because I, I would be remiss if I didn't do that because I haven't gotten here just by reading. I've gotten here because I have a a lady in my life who really has helped me grow, man, and taught me how to be a better father. Because she has a son, I'm I'm a better father to him. A stepfather, I'm better, uh, a a better mate. And I'm a better father to my kids now than I was then because she's helped me understand where I need to compromise, where I need to be gentle. Especially when you have male sons, you you gotta let them be men at some point. Yeah. And it doesn't have to get hostile. Right. So there you go. 
No, salute to Marquita, man. I appreciate that as well. And you actually bringing up something that I wanted to touch on as well, right? Like mm-hmm. raising, you know, young men opposed to, you know, raising daughters. So I want to ask you about this. So it's been a rumor that your son, Cliff Powell Jr., is dating <laughs> Obama's daughter, Sasha, man. Tell yeah. us more about that. Did he come to you for any advice? Like, what's, what's that look like? Uh, that's amazing because, you know, they've been going out for about a year and it just hit the press, right? So because, and, and I got to go back and tell people the way this thing really goes. Before I met Marquita, I have been repeating the same dysfunctional mistakes with almost every relationship I've been in. And I've been in a few. I've been dating since the 70s. So I didn't seen it all, bro. And because of her, and because of the disrespect I've shown her, because of my tone being ugly and mean sometimes, because I move funny. I say I move funny. Because when I go outside, I become... To her, I'm just a, a cool, well, used to, I'm cooler now, but I, back in the day, I wasn't. But I thought I was. You know, I present cool, I'm sharp, I'm articulate, but deep down inside, I could be an asshole. I'm just going to say it. But why? Because I did not have a father to teach me a lot of things that men have to learn before they turn 15, 16, 17, 18, and go out into the world. Why was my dad that way? Well, society, lack of education, lack of opportunity, racism is a lot of things that we can point to. Are those excuses for me? Well, that's no excuse. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Black men are last in any, every category from health to death to suicide, you name it. We're there. So she has helped me talk to Clifton about how to handle Sasha Obama. Because we love the Obamas, but Mr. Obama has a daughter that's dating my son, and I have an opportunity and a responsibility to make my son responsible, gentle, kind, loving, and supportive, the things that I did not get taught. So I text him all the time, and I said, treat Sasha like you would want somebody to treat your daughter. And, I, and, I, and I'm constantly sending him, he's a dad, why he keeps sending me all these memes, man? I said, because, bro, on top of the fact that that's Obama's daughter, that's, a, that, that's, that's what I've learned to do with my, my lady, is to treat her like a queen. Bro, I don't know, seven years ago, I ain't done none of this shit. I'm just telling you. And I got to say shit, sorry, y'all, but we got to keep it real. Seven years ago, before I met this young lady, bro, I didn't know, eight years ago, I'll say, I didn't know none of this shit, bro. None of it. And I've had to do a lot of reading and growing. So that's what I'm doing with Clifton. On top of the fact that I want to be better, I want him to be better than me in every category. So we talk. He's an interesting guy because the way he was raised, he doesn't overhype things. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's chill. So he's when lax, I talk to him, he's like, yeah, 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 guess what I'm saying? So I about, they just, you know, these new millennials is not a big deal that my dad was the president or my dad is Pinky or Clifton the power. To them, not just dad. They see us away from the, from the crowd. So I'm constantly, brother, on him to share with him with Marquita has helped me understand about how to be a good man to a woman. No, nah, that's amazing, man. And I, I love that so much because just like you, I didn't, I grew up without my father. Right. So I always say like, I, you know, as I started dating and, you know, failed relationships, I'm like, I didn't even see what it looked like to, to love a woman. I'm just out here winging it, you know, in a sense. Right. So be, being that you've learned, you know, later in life, but also still are at a point where you can share those gems and give your son, you know, those lessons. That's amazing, man. Now, you haven't got no call or text from from Barack like, hey, you better, you know, your son better take care of my, my daughter, have you? <laughs> not, not yet. But, you know, I want him to know and Michelle to know if they ever hear this, that I'm on my son like every day, man. Not in a negative way, but I send him a meme or I might send him a quote. Like this morning, I just sent him something from Steve Harvey. And also, you know, I know we're talking about sons, but I still want my daughter to be nice. And don't I don't believe in women hitting men or men hitting women. And my, my, my daughter's dating this guy who's such a nice guy. And I employ all of them to listen because 71% of relationships, and now of course, eight years ago, I didn't know none of this stuff that I'm talking about. 
So I had to do a lot of reading and a lot of apologizing and a lot of begging for, you know, and I say asking for forgiveness, not begging, but asking for forgiveness, um, learning how to live in your dysfunction and make it better. So I send memes to my daughter also. And 71% of relationships fail because of communi- miscommunication. So I'm trying to get my kids to understand, just like you got to do with your son, how to communicate properly with your mate. And, and because we want our kids to be happy, you know? And, you know, Sasha and Clifton are both young. She's 28, she's 20, and he's 24. And, you know, hopefully they, you know, I pray that they make it. And I think they can if they just continue to communicate and be gentle and loving with each other and understand it's going to be some ups and downs. But you can get through it if you, if you, if you talk through it in a, in a, in a wonderful and, – and hold yourself accountable. Yeah. No, that's, that's dope, man. Definitely wishing them the best, wishing your daughter the best as well. Or you, you got any grandkids yet? Any grandkids? Oh, oh, shoot. I have two grandkids, uh, Rashad and Eliza. And I talk to them about the same stuff. But, you know, they on a different track right now. They just great. They just glad to be teenagers, about to go to college this year and next year. And um, I told my little granddaughter, she's not dating since she's 50. So she always got me, Grandpa, I got a boy, boyfriend. I'm like, yeah, but you're not going out of that house with him. You, you got to sit right in the living room watching movies with everybody in the room. I, you know, I tease her and, you know, but they're on track. They want to go to college and, and, you know, they're not even into like, you know, smoking weed and hanging out and yeah. doing what some of the other millennials do. I'm sure they might. I don't even think they've snuck and done anything because they just seem <laughs> so kind of clean cut so far. Yeah. No, that, <laughs> but that's I love what... my grandkids too. No, that's what's up, man. And one thing I want to say, you know, like I said, you dropped a lot of gems in this conversation. But one thing I'll say is as we get older, I mean, I'm 34 years old, man. So like even now I'm kind of stuck in certain ways, which is hard to get out of. But being that, you know, eight years ago, you were what, 58 or something like that. And you still were taking Mm -hmm. the the opportunities to learn and grow and and get better and not be stuck in your ways, man. I want to also just salute you for that, because I know as we get older, it's kind of you know, we kind of, you know, are used to certain things and it's hard to change sometimes. Mm-hmm. So being that you, you know, at that age, you know, we're still open to, you know, being better mm-hmm. and learning and reading more. Like, I, I, I love that, man. So that's one thing I want to say about you. Let, let me address that very shortly and very quickly. Part of it is I'm a Pisces, so I'm, I'm very uh, flexible. People see me playing the different characters. You got to go back. I play a lot of pastors. I play a lot of fathers. I play more than just gangsters, you know, and I want to clear that up. People come into my page like he plays a rapist. I let me just clear up about women are loose so people understand. Ruben Cannon cast me in Water Foods Fall in Love, Buffalo Soldiers, uh, uh, Women Are Loose, and I think uh, one or two other movies that I can't remember. And he called me at the final hour for Women Are Loose, and I never got a chance to even read the script until I got to set. And when I got to set, I saw the part about him being in a room with the little girl, and I asked him to take that out. I still did it, and I'm glad I did it because it opened up a conversation between men and women who have been abused so that they had a platform after the film to kind of talk about it, and that part I'm grateful for. But I get a lot of negative comments. Oh, well, Sasha, be careful. Hope you not be, be like his daddy because, you know, people got to stop doing that, taking the characters that you play and make them like you really that way. I've never been arrested, never been in trouble. And I was raised by women and I know that no means no. And I would never, I don't hurt women. I don't hit women. I had to have to learn how to love because I've been tough and I've been all over the place. But I want the fans to understand that, man, that we play characters. I'm a character actor. But women and I are loose specifically. I, I never read the script before I took the job. And Ruben is my guy, man. So when Ruben calls you, you got to go. You know, um, and then I play a lot of pastors. A lot. I play a I play a plethora of wonderful, loving characters that people seem to under under or don't see because when I play a character like Cuddy, so and that should not transfer to my son because I teach my son to be respectful, not to put his hands on women. I teach my daughter not to put her hands on men. I teach my son to be receptive and to be open minded. So you got to stay. When you meet, a, and, and, and I've been dating since the 70s. From the 70s until now, I've never met a woman like Marquita who listens, who's open, who's willing to make adjustments, that holds herself accountable, and hence she's 
help me do the same thing because oftentimes like you, we get stuck. So I would say to you, do some, because off the record, I'll give you some books. Do the reading now because divorce tears children apart. So you really want to be careful going into a marriage and a long-term relationship without having these father skills and male skills of how to love a woman because divorce is rampant now, especially going through the pandemic. So we got to be careful. And so I wanted to share that part. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, man. I'll definitely take some book recommendations offline, man. Like I said, I'm inspired by you. Uh, this has been a great conversation, man. You dropped so many gems. And one thing that we do uh, to kind of close up the Dear Fathers podcast is we have this segment uh, where you write a hypothetical or say a hypothetical letter uh, to your father. So if you could, you know, write a letter to your father starting with Dear Father, what would you say to him? Man, bro. <laughs> Man, I, 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 I don't think I can handle that today. I think I would fall apart right here. But I would just say to my dad, I, I, would, I often, um, excuse me, bro. No, it's, 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 a, it's a deep question, man. I, I totally get it. We've... I oftentimes, in my success, look up in the sky and said, Daddy, I did all right, man. Yeah. Now I'm with you, my man. Dad, my dad came to see me in my first play. And he came up on a stage. He had been drinking. He was drunk. And he tried to shake my hand. And they had to take him out the auditorium. And I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. He said, that's my boy. That's my boy, Clifton Powell. That's my boy. Yeah. And I don't know if people really understand, man, what it's like to lose your mom and have a dad that's dysfunctional but still tries. All I would say to my daddy is, Daddy, I did all right, man. And I thank you for being there, even in your frailty. Because as I look back, and I've gone through my own challenges. I never forgot you, man. And I never, I never forgot the things that my dad told me. So that letter would say, thank you. I remember in, in, in my New York days, I was homeless. And my dad was real frugal, bro, because <laughs> he was old school. And my dad, I was living in a rooming house. And my dad sent me some money, which is rare. If, he, if you needed 200, he might send you 25. But this day, my dad sent $200 through the mail. And the address was all over the page, all over the envelope. And I got it, $200 in cash. And I knew that that was from the bottom of his heart, man. And that $200 helped me eat while I was in that rooming house. So. I would say to my dad today, Daddy, I did all right. No, man, I, I definitely, again, once again, appreciate your transparency, I'm man. Sorry, I can't, I can't, it's just, you know, man, if you ever have kids, bro, your parents, man, you never forget the lessons that they try to give you. Mm -hmm. I know my dad would be so proud of me, my mom. So I would say to my dad, dad, thank you. It don't matter that you didn't have but a fourth education, fourth grade education, because I graduated from college, the first person on the Powell side to graduate from college. I'm doing well with my kids. So thank you for telling me where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you for telling me all you need is faith, the size of a mustard seed. And thank you for always protecting me and making sure I was okay. And even when you drank and in your frailties and your, your dysfunction, your disorientation and your mental illness, I knew you always were there for me. So I thank you, Ted. Yeah, man. He, he's definitely, you know, smiling down, proud towards your mom. Um, you know, that, that, that's deep, man. And I appreciate your transparency, man. I man. tell you, bro, you got me. <laughs> I, I haven't done a lot of podcasts, bro, but you got me on this one. 
man. you know, but you know, man, it's it's, it's really a blessing um, to to be in this place in the world to be able to share my story um, to help people understand that entertainers are human. That as African American entertainers, we should not be held to any different standard than any other entertainer. Entertainer, stop saying this guy right here scares me so much. We're actors. You don't say that to De Niro. Then we're trained actors. It's just character. Stop making memes about, oh, Clinton Powell, I wouldn't want him. Stop doing that. Keith David, stop doing that, man, because mm-hmm. it's disrespectful to us because we don't get the respect from the crossover community like we should because, oh, he played a gangster. He probably killed somebody in real life anyway. Yeah. Stop doing that, y'all. We can't do it to each other because it's not fair. I trained for 25 to 30 years before pe- for 20 years before people ever saw my work. Mm-hmm. So again, thank you, my brother. Thank you to all my fans out there. Thank you to all my friends and my family. Um, fathers, stay. I don't care how hard it is. Even if you have to get out of the house, you're going through it with the baby mama and a wife or whoever, stay in your children's lives, man, because they need fathers. And if you, if you have a father that you at odds with, Think about it from their perspective and try to try to try to find some uh, forgiveness in your heart. That's all I can say. Now you gonna make me have to go get me some sake or some red wine, bro. <laughs> get, get get you some red wine, man. You know, take a sip, man. No, I definitely, you know, this conversation, um, like I said before, this call inspired by your story, the little that we talked offline. This, you know, hour that we've been on, man, even more inspired. Like I said, I would love those book recommendations. Love to continue yes, to deal with you, man. But, you know, before we get out of here, man, tell the people how they can follow you on social media and tell them, you know, what's coming up next for you. Um, you can follow me on social media at It's Clifton Powell. Um, I'm doing, I just finished season six of Thanks and Sinners, so y'all tune in. Uh, go back to Hulu and watch season one through six and make sure you tune in Sunday and watch, you know, episode four, I think four or five of season six. We got three more coming. Go back and watch season one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then I'm uh, doing season two of Sacrifice with Paula Patton, Richard Roundtree. I'm excited about that. Shout out to all my BET friends, my friend Rose Catherine, and some of the other executives over there, Robbie Reed, the casting, um, the Bounce family, uh, Swirl Films, my buddy Eric Thomas uh Keith Neal, James Gutter, all those guys, Jimmy. And to... Um, uh, follow me. I'm, I'm about to, uh, me and uh, Marquita are about to start producing. Uh, so I'm going to move behind the camera and I want to bring to fruition um, some of the stories that I've had all my life. I got one call, uh, ironically, in my father's house. And I do, I, I have another one called A Special Kind of Love, my journey with her on how I've come to learn how to love, you know, mm-hmm. as, a, as a father, as a father, but as a man who grew up without a functioning a father who was a functioning alcoholic and, and not getting the things that I need. And I'm not saying that to hold that against my dad. It's just the way it is. I think he helped me become a better father, you know? So yeah. it's all of that. That's what I'm doing. And I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to direct, but I definitely have some great stories to bring to the film, to the, to the screen. So yeah. y'all come out and support. We got to hear about it. Definitely going to support the shows that you own. Definitely going to support, you know, if you produce direct, whatever the case may be, those are some great, uh, you know, uh, storylines that you can tell just based on your own journey. I would love to, you know, anything fatherhood related, you know, tap in dear fathers, man. Like, you know, we can get involved in any way possible, whether it be just promoting it, put it putting it out there or, you know, just kind of having conversations. So, you know, we're looking forward yep. to uh, continuing to build with you, man. Definitely appreciate your time today um, on the Dear Fathers podcast and, you know, definitely appreciate you, man. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you all out there. Thank you again. Thank you again for having me, man. And last thing I want to say, man, fathers, don't give up, man. Stay connected to your daughters, to your sons. Keep trying to get the wife or the or the, uh, the mother of your child to see it from your perspective, but just don't disconnect. God bless y'all. Appreciate y'all. Thank you for watching everything I've done. Talk to you soon, my brother. I'm Aya Tometi. I'm sure you've heard the saying, but it really does take a village. That's why I chose Kinley, a financial services company proudly built for Black America. Together, we create solutions. 
Go to B-E-K-I-N-L-Y dot com to download the app today. Standard data rates from your wireless service provider may apply. The Kinley Deposit Account is established by Central Bank of Kansas City. Member FDIC. The Kinley Visa Debit Card is issued by Central Bank of Kansas City. Consult the deposit account agreement and fee schedule for complete details. Time is money and I'm working on that Richard Mill. It's up to me to drop the ball like I'm finna.